What's going on, everyone? How are y'all doing? This is Polly Escobedo. Welcome to the Four Hours of Sleep podcast with your host, Polly Escobedo. Uh, last night I got about seven hours of sleep, which ain't too bad compared to the four hours I sometimes get. This time I um I work Sunday night, and I might not anymore, which is nice because uh, I got things I want to do on Sundays. There's always some mics to do, uh, a lot of showcase shows I can get on. One thing I really want to accomplish is um, getting on the uh, San Francisco Punchline. And to get on that uh, show, what you got to do uh, is basically the level I'm at is you got to show up to the Punchline every Sunday. And you just got to add tally marks next to your name until you accumulate enough for they let you go on. Now, how many do you need? I don't know that. All I know is that you just got to keep going. And uh, a lot of comics don't like doing that, you know. But you got to put in that grind. You got to put in that. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Now nah, you got to do a bunch of bullshit before you can, you know, get up on the stages you want. <laughs> but I had just recorded about, you know, 20, 30 minutes of a podcast before I realized my microphone wasn't connected. So I was talking to nobody. And uh, that sucked. But here I am. I'm back doing this. Uh, part, you know, take two. Electric Boogaloo. Let's do this. I need some intro music. I'm going to do that for my next podcast. Figure that out. Um, Yeah. So today's podcast, I want to talk about, like, you know, my own little comedy influences. Like, what, what gave me my sense of humor. And I know, like, starting out, like, when I was younger, like, some of my earliest memories are coming home or being at home and watching The Simpsons with my brother. And that was, like, the thing we did as a family, like, every night for years, you know? Like, weekdays, it was on three times a night. It was on, um, 6 to 6, 6 and 6.30 on Fox. And then it was on at 7.30 on UPN. Like, back then, UPN was a station that, you know, basically showed reruns of other shit. But um, now, I think all they do is show Riverdale. I, I don't know what they got going on. They just show, like, really terrible teen shows. And uh, drag out, or, yeah, drag out shows till they're bad. Like, Green Arrow and The Flash and Supernatural. <laughs> but, yeah, so, you know... The Simpsons, what kind of gave me my, like, initial sense of humor. You know, just adult cartoons, like Family Guy and Futurama, stuff like that. It's also really big in, um, like, comedy movies, like Happy Gilmore. You know, anything Adam Sandler, but Happy Gilmore, I still say, is, like, my top favorite movie of all time. Like, I could rewatch that and still laugh. Just a little subtle humor like that. I really love Adam Sandler. Like, you could tell he's a genuine good guy. And, uh, I don't know, that's something I appreciate. I can always get behind him no matter what. Um, I also had an uncle growing up, and he kind of had, like, a little kid sense of humor, which really appealed to me when I was seven and eight, you know? He told me some jokes. He was always giving me jokes I thought were hilarious. And, uh, for the third grade talent show, I did stand-up, and I used a lot of those jokes. I basically stole them from him and used them on stage. And I remember one joke, and the joke went, like, um, three guys were in a desert, and their car broke down. And the first guy, he took the windshield, so that way he could keep the sand out of his face. The second guy took the roof of the car to, you know, give him some shade from the desert uh, sun. The third guy, he didn't know what to take, so he went, uh, 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 and he took the car door. The other two guys asked him, hey, uh, why are you taking the car door? And his response was, oh, so that way, if it gets hot, I can roll the window down. Yeah. Uh, all the other third grade kids busted up laughing. They were they thought it was hilarious, even though I told them this joke in class I don't know how many times. The other older kids, they didn't laugh that hard. They didn't like it that much. But um, they were my audience, you know? That's one thing you gotta learn is you gotta learn who your audience is. And it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't kids who have gone through puberty yet <laughs> it's younger kids but you know um i always had a love for stand-up uh i got really into it this one this 
one spring week in spring I got the flu and I think I was in seventh grade and all I did for the entire week was just lay on the couch with uh, a fever watching premium blend on Comedy Central and th that introduced me to a whole bunch of comics you know a bunch of great comics some of them already established others were up and coming um, I got to see like Ron White for the first time Bill Burr Gabriel Iglesias Kevin Hart, Dimitri Martin, Mitch Hedberg, uh, all these great guys coming up, you know, so, well, some of them were already established, but like, they were new to me, and I got to see them, and it really like, made me fall in love with it again, you know, all these different various styles, you know, but they all had one thing funny, or one thing in common, is that they were funny, you know, uh, I even like, stole a Nick Sparkson bit, and used it on a uh, my seventh grade girlfriend and aim chat when we we're talking on aim and really wooed her with it and uh made me think oh i could do stand-up i mean stand-up's easy when you're just stealing other people's material but you know writing it on your own a whole different story which is funny because back then like i didn't really see you know i was what 12 i didn't really see the issue with like taking someone else's material but i did think in my head at the time like man how can writing jokes how oh, is that something someone can do this seems so goddamn hard and here i am doing it i don't claim to be doing it well at all but you know i'm giving it a shot <laughs> um yeah that was also around the time that Chappelle show came out and uh, that was really big on me you know just that like shock that sense of humor he had and even his stand-up like i had killing him softly memorized like just every little part of it you know like the baby on the corner things like that you know <gasps> sprinkling crack on him uh just Chappelle was just on another level early on then also like you know I was watching Colbert Report Daily Show and that really spoke to me especially like Jon Stewart his ability to call the ridiculousness out and people who are like hypocrites you know and I took that with me in like everyday life like that really helped me out too like an ability to call people out while being funny about it um it prevented me from getting my ass kicked a whole lot <laughs> like you can call someone out as long as you make them laugh like if you don't make them laugh then you got problems but if you can be funny about it you get away with a lot um what else did i like you know just other stoner movies judd apatow super bad it's one of my favorite movies um something that spoke to me too was super bad because Seth Rogen and his friend Evan Goldberg, like, from what I read, I'm not sure if it's 100% true, you gotta fact check me on this, but, like, they were writing that movie since they were, like, kids, basically, you know? And it made me think, hey, I could, I could do some writing, too. Um, for a bit, I didn't watch a whole lot of stand-up, like, I did watch some specials, like Gabriel Glessius, uh, some Bill Burr. Things like that. You know, whatever Netflix had, some Louis C.K. But when I started training MMA, I kind of fell out of it. But got back into it once I started listening to like Joe Rogan's podcast. And I wasn't a huge fan of his stand-up. But I did enjoy his takes and like hearing him talk about MMA and inter interviewing fighters and whatnot. Uh, once he put Joey Diaz on, like the first time I heard Joey Diaz, I was like, alright. Like that was a game changer for me. Just like listening to his like style of comedy, like his storytelling. His, like, ability to, like, just, like, uh, pull shit out of his ass on the spot. That was hilarious, you know? Like, his wording, his phrasing, like, his vocabulary. Like, that was, that was what comedy was to me. And it was a game changer. So, I started listening to his podcast religiously. At the time, he had the Church of What's Happening Now. It was him and his co-host, Lee Sayat. And, like, I started listening to him all the time. Like just talking about his struggles and things like that and him starting comedy and him giving advice on starting comedy and i hadn't even really considered it at the time but i thought hey maybe sometime down the road it's something i want to do so i'm gonna start doing what he says you know he was saying you know you got right all the time you gotta jot down funny ideas you have and that's what i did like in the note section of my phone i was just writing down ideas for bits anytime i had a funny thought so I'd remember. Because a lot of times, you know, you'll think, oh, I'll remember that. You know, 
Well, that's really funny. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to remember that. No problem. But then you forget. And you don't even know you forgot sometimes. So just like writing it down as fast as possible has helped a lot. At least for me. Um, Joey was actually, I had seen a couple like stand-up comics, but Joey was like the first one that like I bought tickets for. Like I took him or I took my training partner at MMA and my then girlfriend, who's my son's mom now. I took them to go see Joey Diaz, you know? And what's funny is, um, a comedian I perform with regularly. Uh, I don't know if he wants me to say his name, but he opened for Joey. I don't remember. I don't remember that well he did say like the audience just stared at him until joey came out and i kind of remember that but i don't want to tell him <laughs> um but it's just crazy to think at this point like uh i was like you know way back then and now i'm kind of like performing with this guy weekly seeing him around getting to know him and he got to open for joey but like seeing joey like blew my mind you know and joey was the type of guy like he goes and he hangs out after the show to meet you know his fans and like shake their hands and talk to him a little bit and i was a little shy but i still wanted to go up and shake his hand you know so i made my uh, girlfriend come with me to go say hi so we're walking up to him and his eyes widen and he looks right past me and he looks right at my girlfriend he goes hello beautiful i like your hair and i'm just like whatever fuck it like it's a compliment fucking uncle joey's over here digging my girl He's not going to take her from me. I don't, you know, he's got his own shit. He's got a wife at home, other stuff like that. He's just, you know, being cute, whatever. So I didn't mind it too much, you know, but I just thought it was funny. Like I'm over here all excited. Like I get to meet him and he just fucking looks right past me, right to my girl. <laughs> but uh, I teased her for the longest time about that shit. Like just ran and be like, hey, beautiful. I like your hair. Just to upset her. It's good stuff. But, um. Yeah, for a while, like, uh, I just watched stand-up and didn't really think about starting it, you know? Like, I always stood in the scene. Well, not really stood in the scene, but always, like, stayed up to date on it, you know? Listening to Joey all the time. Watching, like, Rogan's Friends, uh, Theo Vaughn and Neil Brennan. Neil Brennan had a huge influence on me. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, you know, like, how much he like he really influenced my life like he like growing up he was part of like nearly every comedy thing i was into you know he was writing for all of that that i was watching when i was a kid and he was doing sketch comedy and then you know i didn't know that Chappelle basically had larry david you know so if, to find that out it was pretty big for me like i wanted to see what this guy was about so i started really looking at neil brennan um you know he didn't really have a podcast. He has a podcast now, Three Blocks. I've been listening to every episode, and it's really great. Uh, but he didn't have a whole lot out at the time. Um, there was one summer right before my son was born. We didn't know at the time, but he was with us when we went to the, the comedy store. Yeah, I took my girl to the comedy store. We went on a little L.A. vacation. I want to check out the comedy store. The first night, we were like, oh, let's get tickets for Joey Diaz. I want to see Joey again. So we get there. Uh, the doorman tells us, hey, you know, Joey's sold out right now. Or not. Well, if you want to see Joey, you know, you're going to have to wait. Tickets are sold out. But, you know, you can hang out, wait till people leave, whatnot. I'm like, okay, yeah, we'll do that. So me and her were waiting in line. And I guess we're unknowingly waiting in line for the belly room. Like, we didn't know what the setup was. So we're standing there. And I see uh, Chris D'Elia, you know, he's on his phone. He's inside the building texting. Like, Whoa, you know, there's Chris D'Elia. Like, he was really big at the time. He's still big now. He's just uh, he's a controversial figure, <laughs> so to say. But, you know, that kind of blew my mind. And I look to the right, and I see in the comedy store parking lot, it's uh, Joey Diaz, the old fawn, and this other comic. And they're all hanging out, and they're bullshitting. You can see them laughing. And, like, my mind's blown. It's like, whoa, like, they are just there hanging out. Like, this is really, like, the place, you know? Like, I heard stories about this place, and it's really cracking up, you know, living up to it. Ali Wong comes out. She hugs Joey. She leaves. 
my girl gets all excited because, you know, all the girls know Ali Wong and love her. She's like, there's Ali Wong, you know? And I was like, wow, like, this is just them hanging out. Uh, some drunk bitch behind me, like, just starts yelling, Theo, Theo, can I get a picture with you? And even though, like, this chick's obnoxious, she's drunk, you know, she's interrupting uh, Theo, talking to fucking Uncle Joey and shit. He still comes over and he snaps a picture with her, you know, snaps multiple pictures with her. Cause she had the, uh, the audacity to be like, yeah, I don't like that first one, but he didn't care. He was that cool. And that, you know, that, that actually gave me a lot of respect for Theo. Cause like, he, you know, he took the time to come take a picture with this drunk chick, even though she was being annoying and he didn't act like it bothered him at all. He was super cool about it. So we were there. Um, some comic i would never seen him before. I guess he hosts some show at the Belly Room. It's called Crack 'em Up Thursdays or something. But we got, we went in there and we sat right in the front. We got fucking picked on a lot. But uh, yeah, we I say we got tricked into going to that show because we're trying to wait for Joey and we somehow ended up in there. But cue to two nights later, we go back to the comedy store. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to let that happen again. I want to go into the other rooms, you know. I don't want to just sit in some belly room show by accident. And uh, I was really impressed by just, like, the lineup that we saw, you know. Like, just dishing out. I think we saw Eric. Was it Eric Smith? Is that his name? Eric Anders. He's on Workaholics. Hilarious guy. He was hella funny. We saw Chris D'Elia. We saw Neil Brennan. We saw Andy Letterman. We saw Sam Tripoli. And they all just, like, killed it. And it was great, you know, just watching all these high-level comics just go through the material and perform. Like, it was amazing to me, you know? And I still had, like, doing comedy in the back of my mind. Like, um, I knew that I couldn't do MMA anymore. Like, it just wasn't sustainable. Like, I was getting older. You know, my body was wearing down, getting hurt. Uh, my coach had, like, basically shut down shop. And he was, like my coach you know he he was head coach at aka for the longest time he had his own place he decided to like close down move to sf or something and then i didn't want to go pay aka prices to train and just get beat up you know and not only that but i was watching like a lot of my mma idols just get old too and not be doing good like really you know getting hurt um doing crazy stuff from head trauma uh just wasn't looking good for them you know and that's not to say like comedy will do any better than that but at least your body doesn't break down as bad you don't lose or get as many concussions don't make as much money as or still don't make money like you do in mma but still you know so have doing that in the back of my mind um I bought tickets to go see Mark Marin with my girl that November. Was it November? I think it was November. And he was in SF. So we go and we see Mark Marin. And by then I was like right, really writing. Like really trying to figure out how I'm going to start doing this. Uh, me and Mark. Mark did a bit. And it was really similar to a bit I had written. So Mark Marin's bit was um, basically like health trends and how like turmeric. Like, he just felt like the turmeric people were like, how are we going to sell this shit? Well, we'll tell people it's good for them, you know? My bit was similar. It was basically the Chia Pet people being like, hey, people aren't watching infomercials anymore. How are we going to move all these Chia seeds? Well, we'll tell them it's a health food, you know? So, Mark doing a bit similar to the one I wrote made me feel like, hey, I, I think I'm on track. Like, I think I have the writing down. If, you know, a high-level comic like Mark and I came up with the same thing must be a good sign right sucks because um I, I i still feel weird using that bit because it's so similar to mark's you know with the parallel thinking and everything but whatever um i think the couple of times i did use that bit it didn't even do that good so fuck it but that really made me feel like you know i was on the right track at least writing wise you know um another comp comic who really you know it's pretty controversial like louis ck um you really gotta separate the artist and the art just his like single dad humor really appealed to me uh his show louis there's a three-part uh episode arc 
where he auditions for the late show and it really covers like the insecurity of like trying for something more feeling like you can't do it doing new things to reach a new level and like for me that's really what covered like stand up for me and um i kind of took inspiration from that like it was basically like a comedy rocky story right so the first time i did comedy when i went to the blue lagoon santa cruz my mindset wasn't like oh i'm go- i'm only going to win if i kill you know like really what i thought was even if i get on stage and eat a dick the fact that i did it at all is a victory for me you know it's my own personal victory like i could get booed and whatnot but the fact that i still grew the balls to get up there and do this on my own like that that's a victory in my opinion and luckily i did good because it was great for my self-confidence you know like that isn't to say i haven't eaten a dick plenty of times after but that time i did pretty good it's amazing for your first time i mean a lot of people do good their first time but i meant like it's amazing for like your confidence on your first time i'm not saying i'm amazing or anything like that no i fucking i i I still have it rough out there many nights don't worry (laughs) but uh yeah i got back in my car and i was yelling i did it you know to myself i was so excited i was so happy Um, on the way there too, I listened to Bill Burr talk about like just following your dream, you know, like there's no risk in that. There's greater risk in trying to play it safe and ending up unhappy and just like spending a life dreaming about like struggling, but following your dream, you know, and think about that. What if, and, um, I had a coworker who was about, he was pretty, a little bit older than me and, um, I could tell he was upset that he gave up on his dream. And uh, I didn't want that for myself, you know? Like, even if I don't make it, at least I gave it a shot. And who knows, you know? Like, this could go very well for me or it could go very bad. But at least I'm do- giving it all I can. And that's really where, you know, this fucking four hours of sleep comes from. Because. You know, that I work at 5 in the morning, you know, unloading trucks for uh, the store I work at. And then I'll be out till sometimes, you know, won't get home till 11, 11.30. Try to crash out as fast as I can. But it's not that easy. Like, you got to unwind a little bit before you can fall asleep. So, but at the end of the day, like, I'm, I'm doing things different so I can get more sleep, you know. Because even though, like, putting in that grind and everything's important, lack of sleep catches itself to you. That's one thing I've noticed, unfortunately. Like, I'll take naps in, during the day in between, you know, doing stand-up and working, but it's not as good as a consistent sleep. Uh, I think I really noticed it this last Sunday I did a show. When my performance at work had been steadily dropping. Like, I had uh, a manager I'm really close to who's helped me out plenty. Oh man, my coffee got all muddy. I put mushroom powder and cacao in there. It's like a sludge at the bottom right now. But like a brain sludge, like it's good for you. I don't know. But uh, I had a manager call me out about my performance. And then what really hit me was I just noticed I had a lot more irritability. And the worst part was my lack of energy on stage. Like, when you're up there performing, the audience feels your energy right away. Like, you know, you, your energy can dictate whether whether or not they laugh or they get on board with you. And unfortunately, since I had no energy, they were against me. You know, like, I went up there dead tired and I could not win them over. Like, I didn't have that in me. So, like, and because I was so tired, like, I just... And you could see defeat on my face, like, so I, and to be fair, like, um, every comic before me was, like, eating a dick, so it wasn't just, like, specifically me, but I've, you know, um, been learning, like, how to win the audience over, get their attention, and stuff like that, so even when other more experienced comics were trying and ate a dick, like, I still managed, you know, it's just part of the game, like, things you gotta learn that night I just I did worse than anyone I got off the stage and the hostess came up and she was just like hey guys like 
the comedy show when you see a comic up here really struggling can you help him out and just laugh a little bit this this all our self-esteem up here and uh she definitely meant well she was trying to help me out you know there was no um what's the word i'm looking for there was like nothing like mean or anything negative nothing like that she was just trying to help me out but hearing it sucked <laughs> You know, hearing it put that way. Which, you know, it's part of the game. You just you get used to shit like that. But, uh... Yeah, trying to get more sleep. Because it affects a lot more. But still trying to stay on that grind, you know? Like... That's one thing, you know, a lot of people don't do. And they wonder why they don't make it. I mean, that's one thing I really heard from Joey Diaz, like main comedy inspiration on me it was just you gotta keep putting yourself out there you gotta keep doing it you gotta keep grinding you gotta keep writing and you can't let up and you can't like fault you know get too too comfortable that's one thing i noticed you know like i born and raised in san jose did the majority of my stuff in san jose you know live the majority of my life in san jose i should say um but I'm classified as a Santa Cruz comic because that's mostly where I perform. And, like, I know the Santa Cruz scene. I know the audience there and stuff like that. But if I stay in that area too much, I'm not going to grow as a comic, you know? Like, you got to learn how to handle different audiences. You got to learn things like that. Like, I, I definitely say, like, I have various material, you know? Like, um, I talk about, like, being a dad a lot. Like, uh, and, you know, finding, like, humor in my sense, like, putting my sense of humor into it, you know, my butthole jokes and whatnot, and, um, sometimes audiences don't like that, and you gotta switch over the material, like, the, a couple weeks ago, usually that material does good at the Blue Lagoon, but the audience wasn't having it, they were, it was just quiet when I was telling those jokes, so I switched it to the, like, raunchiest, dirtiest material I got and they were all paying attention they all got into it you know like I got the crowd over onto my side they're hyper focused on what I was talking about so to go from not paying attention at all to just fully invested but you know every audience is different I've they love that like it's a story about uh this couple who wanted me to cuck the husband you know like story I tell it's one of my best usually my closing bit right um a lot of raunchy or dirty or audiences love that like that's their favorite bit for me to tell uh the other couple months ago I did that bit in front of this audience um and it did not go good so the guy who uh booked me for the show basically it was it's like a open kind of it's a future show but he puts basically the people he wants on like i didn't get paid for it but it was good experience to like go hang out with these other comics perform you know get a spot whatnot which is really what i'm all about right now it's just getting as much stage time as possible so i go and i perform and the comic who booked me he's a pretty raunchy guy you know he has a lot of good you know good takes a lot of like raunchy material so I figure I'll bring I'll bring that energy that I think that you know will do good in front of an audience like his. Uh, I was wrong. The people there were mostly like couple middle aged couples. They were mostly like Indian too. So this was like in Sunnyvale, like in like you know where all the tech companies are. Uh, they did not like my material. They did not enjoy it at all. The only person who was laughing hysterically at my shit was this like black like older black gentleman from like louisiana who was like with the white family he was the only guy he was my best friend that night homeboy was laughing at everything i was saying but nobody else did just him man yeah <laughs> oh man that, that dude was awesome yeah he's why i didn't fucking jump in front of a car that night you know yeah but it just goes to show, like, you know, different audiences need different material. And you can't get too comfortable performing in front of one type of audience. Because then you don't really grow. You don't really see what works. And you don't really learn how to handle changing the situation, you know. 
and um, I think that's really important. That's why like I'm constantly trying to switch up where I'm performing. But tonight's Monday, and uh, in Santa Cruz, there's two open mics I can go to, or I can go to two open mics in San Jose. I know the Santa Cruz open mics usually get a lot more of an audience, and I'll and my type of audience. Like I know I'll do good. I'll feel good confident you know i have a great time a lot of my friends are going to be there or i can go to the san jose ones i don't really go to to a whole lot i'll meet new people you know new comics with different types of material you know hang out for a bit um and really get like various crowds that i might not know how to handle but it's something i need it's something i gotta get outside my comfort zone and grow you know learn how to handle those comics i mean not those comics those type of crowds because like you look at it like when i'm in santa cruz like and there's like bigger crowds like bigger crowds are a lot easier for me like it's really easy to really like feed off of the energy of a large crowd and give them my energy and whatnot but when it's like a smaller crowd like when there's only like five to ten people and i'm making eye contact distinctly with them for me, that's harder. It's a lot more intimate. And uh, that's something I have trouble with. You know, maybe in general, just like that little one-on-one -on -one intimacy. I don't know. Maybe I have intimacy problems. Who knows? Who doesn't, right? <laughs> but uh, that's something I got to get used to. Something I really got to work on. Because it's big. Especially in this business. You know? Something that I also got to work on is like my crowd work. I don't have a whole lot of crowd work. Or crowd work skills, I should say. Because like I was saying, those like one-on-one -on -one little intimacy things are, are hard for me. But they're also really important. So tonight, there's uh, two open mics in San Jose area. And I think I gotta hit both of them up. Just to work on that. You know, working with different crowds and whatnot. If not both, at least one, you know. Because, um... I don't know, I got, I got some stuff I want to do today. Uh, I want to eat right. I want to get some water in me. Like, I also want to work out, but I injured my rib. So I really just knew I couldn't do MMA anymore. It was after the pandemic. Um, I was still, like, kind of dad bod. Like, my son was probably one, one and a half, something like that. I had a friend who was training for a local Muay Thai title fight, right? I was like, hey, do you want to help spar with me? And, like, my style is, like, full-on MMA or, you know, wasn't really, like, Muay Thai kickboxing. Like, I could box. Like, I love boxing, but, like, Muay Thai is a whole different whole different game, you know, with elbows and knees. But I was like, you know what, fuck it. Yeah, I'll help you. Like, I want to get back into this. I love this sport. Let's do it. So I was a little bit out of shape. I go and I spar him. Uh, his coach shows me a video of his opponent, and his opponent, like, would, like, anytime uh, someone would throw something at him, he kind of rock back a little bit, and then come in and counter with, like, crazy hooks. Like, all right, I'll try that, you know? It's easy. It's not anything, you know? I could do that, help my friend out for his fight. So, like, we're sparring, we're feeling each other out, and then I go to do that. He must have seen the same shit I saw because as soon as I opened for that hook, he threw the hardest fucking knee right in my floating rib. And like, I, it hit hard. He landed flush as I'm coming in, you know, just to add more weight behind that impact. So I go back, you know, I rock back, kind of flow a little bit. I'm like, okay. In my mind, I'm thinking... That hurt. That really hurt. But I'm alright. You know, I've been hit worse before. I ain't too bad. I can, you know, shake this off. I can hide that, you know, how bad it really hurt. I'm good. So, you know, we continue the round. Da, 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 da. I throw the same hook. He throws the same knee and the same rib. And then I absorb that impact. Rock back a little bit. I'm like, okay, that really, really fucking hurt. I, I There's no way I can take another shot right there. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so... Finish the round. Uh, I'm being pumped with, a, you know, I got adrenaline going through me because I was fighting. I think I'm good. I'm not. Uh, the next day, I couldn't roll over in bed. It, was, I, it took me forever to get out of bed. I had to, like, climb up my bed post and everything like that. Fucking sucked. He, he got me good. I want to say he hairline fractured my rib or something. 
I don't know. I don't I don't go to doctors. I don't trust them. I'm just kidding. But I didn't go to a doctor. Uh, I think he might have also hurt something in my forearm. I don't know. But it hurt to pick up my son. Like... I couldn't bend over really. I had to like do weird squatting maneuvers. Um, I couldn't pick him up normally with my hand. I had to like put my forearm up to my elbow under his armpit with my right arm to pick him up. It was at that point I knew I couldn't do it anymore. Like um, I couldn't get beat up like that anymore. I had someone to worry who's worrying about me. You know, I had someone to take care of. Not only that, but. When I was 20 and I would get hit like that, like, yeah, I would get injured, but I would heal like Wolverine. Like when I was like 18 taking shots like that, like I'd heal in like a couple of days, you know, a couple hours, I'd be fine. And now that I was 30, that took a month. It was a month of fucking agony. And I think it got re-injured this last Wednesday and it hurts like hell. Like it's hard to get out of bed and I haven't really worked out since. Even though I know I need to, like, with my being a personal trainer and, like, studying physical therapy, I know the best thing for it. So maybe not weight lift, but, you know, definitely get some endurance, some cardio in there and get the blood flowing, you know. Uh, but, I don't know, I've been lazy. Uh, summer's coming up, too, and I got a little caught on stage. Like, I gotta get some color. Uh, I hate this camera, too, because camera one, I look a little bit more tan. Camera two, I look pale as fuck. Yeah, I gotta get some more color in me. I'll lose some face fat. You know, I think everyone's on that same boat with me right now. You know, it's been a long winter, especially here in California. It's been fucking raining like crazy. Oh, man. But, what was I talking about before I go off subject so much? That's my AD, ADD, ADHD, whatever the hell I got. I just, I'll go down rabbit holes and just keep talking and go way off subject. Especially since, you know, it's a one-on-one podcast right now. I got no one interrupting me. Pretty soon I'm going to start bringing on guests. You know, interviewing people. Uh, This next week, next week I'm going to bring on my friend. Her name is Geek Etiquette. Geeky. Uh, It's actually Amy. But I met her on Twitch. She's super dope. She's a cool girl. She actually made my cover art for me. For the podcast. And I've known her for a number of years. She's originally from England and, uh, like, I don't know, London area. I don't know any geography with over there. But she moved over. She met her husband online and moved to Georgia to be with him. So going from, like, you know, I fuck around with her, going from tea to sweet tea, you know. Uh, it'll be an interesting interview. It'll be my first interview. So I'll, I'll be learning, you know, what questions to ask, you know, how to make it fun, stuff like that. But I think I'm going to talk about, like, my favorite top comedians of all time. I feel like the list changes a bit. You know, when I was younger, it was way different. Like, when I was younger, I guess my favorite comedians, like, when I was watching Premium Blend in seventh grade, I was was talking about my favorite comedians were Dimitri Martin, Louis Black, uh, Mike Babiglia. Who else did I like? Ron White. I never got into Dane Cook. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I didn't like his style of comedy, and which really sucked because I remember being on MySpace and trying to write bits and stuff like that, and I showed it to my friend, and my friend was just like, no, nah, it's not funny, man. Like, this ain't Dane Cook. I could read Dane Cook's material and laugh, and I'm not laughing at anything you're putting and that fucking put me off of doing stand-up, man. Like, uh, that that definitely delayed me. But that was just my own personal bullshit, you know? Well, also, I was like 14. Like, how fucking good of jokes could I have been writing back then, right? But, anyways, those were like Guy well, and uh, fucking Nick Swartzen, you know? I'm really big on him back then. Now, oh, Dave Chappelle, of course, as well. But now, um, I say, like, my top favorite comedians, in no particular order, except for, like, the first five or four, like, they're interchangeable who my favorite is. Uh, I gotta say Joey Diaz, Bill Burr, um, Neil Brennan, Mark Marin, 
you know, and then you can throw in like Mulaney and I know it sucks or not sucks to say, but controversial, you know, Louis C.K. Um, just his style of like single dad humor, like appeals to me. And I've talked about like separating art from the artist before and not like trying to defend anything he does or did. Yeah. <laughs> sensitive subject I shouldn't even mention him from now on really but uh yeah let's say Mulaney Gaffigan he's great a lot of those guys are just really like Bill Burr I love because of like his ability to call bullshit on not just other people but himself and make that funny like those realizations that you're the asshole you know and you have to work on your shit that's what I like. And that's something everybody can relate to or should. You know, a lot of people out there right now don't don't up don't own up to their bullshit when they should. And I feel like it's important to do that. And I know for a fact I need to do it more. <laughs> like I'm not over here preaching like I'm, you know, some guy who's always up to date and when they're you know, admitting when they're wrong. I like to think I am, but sometimes it takes a while, and by then some damage is caused. Uh, Joey Diaz, like I just love his ability to, just his storytelling, and his abil and his ability to like really, like s come up with these off the wall hilarious things. Like I was listening to a pod, one of his podcasts with like Lee Sayat, and then I guess Lee took his girlfriend to Long Beach for New Year's, right? And Joey was like, when he told me. He went to Long Beach. I told him, here's what you do, all right? In your GPS, put the ocean and go fucking drive your car off the pier. Like, I don't know what, just how he said it. And just like, I couldn't stop laughing. And just him talking about like ricocheting farts off the wall to aim at people like he's playing billiards. Like, man, he had one story and I would tell it to my son's mom all the time. So it was that fucking funny. And her and I would both laugh all the time. It was when uh, he was on a plane and some lady was asleep wearing goggles and she was asleep, asleep with her mouth open, right? And Joey ricocheted a fart off the seat and aimed it at her mouth. And she, <laughs> she said that she shook like she just got a jolt to the heart. Like, <sighs> Just like, yeah. Telling stories like that, describing it in that way, like that, yeah. I take a lot from that, you know? That covers Joey and Bill, Neil, Neil Brennan. And why I say like he's one of my favorites is uh, like he, he has such a like, great like um track record, you know, with like all that and Chappelle show, like definitely a resume, you know, half baked. Even though you know, I guess it bombed at the office. You know, you talk about half baked with anyone, they love that movie. But um, what I really like about him is like he goes into those areas of like anxiety, you know talking about like worries and stuff like that talking about trying to like feel better and um also just like you know how that like really fucked up like social interactions like how like he said like because of his like social anxiety and stuff like that he would like give off the impression unknowingly that you know he, he was better than other people and he goes i never felt that way or wanted to, you know people to think that way of me but like I just had no control over it and the worst part was like he knew he was doing it but couldn't stop it and I feel that a lot you know like I definitely have like issues with like anxiety and social anxiety and stuff like that which is really why like stand up was um something I really wanted to do and something I felt would like help with my personal growth you know like going out there and like meeting people and performing in front of people and putting yourself out there like, I'm not going to lie, like, for the longest time, like, I know I'm only 11 months in this, my stand-up journey right now, but the first couple months, I was just drunk. I had to get real, really drunk. I mean, I wouldn't say, like, blackout drunk, but, like, I knew a point where, like, I was three, four drinks in, you know, I was, like, pretty buzzing just so I can get that confidence to go on stage. And even then, I was still super anxious and super nervous, you know, that I was going to fuck it up somehow. But... Luckily for me, I just, I was able to get that sort of out-of-body experience, you know, where um, I was able, able to perform and not really be me, which is another thing 
about like these inspiration, you know, my comedy inspirations is like for the longest time, I just felt like I was kind of emulating them on stage, you know, which is something that like I heard a lot of well, majority of comedians do nearly every comedian does. Like it takes a while before you actually find your own voice when you're on stage, you know, like um, I go up there my first set. I really was just channeling, like, Louis C.K. That's all I was really doing. I was just, like, going up there as him. And then um, switch off between, like, that and Bill Burr or Neil Brandon. Occasionally, Joey Diaz. I can't really, couldn't really pull that off on stage a whole lot, I noticed. But, like, switching off between those guys. And even still to this day, I still feel like from time to time I do that, you know? There's even one local comic who... He was, he's similar to me. Uh, he's a lot funnier, a lot better looking, more charismatic, but somehow I still think he's similar to me. Mm-hmm. Way more successful than I am. But um, even was pulling a little bit of him. I was like, hey, I can kind of, I kind of perform or see myself as like that. Maybe I'll just like channel him a little bit since it's similar to me, you know? But in the end, it, it still wasn't like really me i was still kind of going up there performing as these other people with my material it's something i'm still working on you know something still going up there and trying to really just be myself in my own voice and i think that's the hardest thing for a lot of comics to go up there and really like be yourself doing your material but i feel like once you figure that out like it's a game changer and things are a whole lot easier you know um, basically covered all my influences. Now yeah, there's Ron White. Really loved him. I don't know. I'm just naming comics I like now, and not really like anything that I took from them. You know. Um, I'm about 47 minutes in. I feel like that. That's a pretty good time to end this podcast. Uh, upcoming shows I got. Every Tuesday at the Blue Lagoon, Blue Lagoon. <laughs> Every Tuesday, Blue Lagoon in Santa Cruz. You can find me there at least doing five minutes. I'll be doing the light and the sound. That's my contribution. Um, this Saturday, I got the XL Public House in Salinas. You know, I'll be there doing my guest spot, checking tickets, helping out with the show, making sure everything goes good. Blue Lagoon is ran by my buddy DNA. He gives me time, puts me up. I'm extremely grateful. And the XL Public House is ran by my friend, Michael Booth. Once again, he lets me contribute. He gives me time. I'm extremely grateful for it. But those are the two shows I got coming up. Um, Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, It's been great. This next episode, I'll probably be doing an interview if I don't do something in between. But appreciate y'all. All right. Much love. Take care, everybody.